All right, let's get into the meat of the project. Uh, we're going to be tackling the SPI master in VHDL. And this code is going to be instantiating a SPI master, um, but without the chip select functionality. So this is going to be yeah, on the input side, you're going to give it a byte and a data valid pulse to say the byte is good. And the spy master is going to just serialize that pulse and send it out to the whatever SPI slave you're talking to out on the line. Um, and that's pretty much the, all the functionality of this module. So there's no chip select functionality in this piece of code. That's going to be added on later because um, one, it makes it a little bit more straightforward if you kind of break up projects into more manageable chunks. And two, um, not everything needs a chip select, so this is just a little more efficient if your application doesn't need a chip select for whatever reason. Now, if you want to look at this code, uh, you can go to github.com forward slash nandland, N-A-N-D-L-A-N-D, -D, and then click on the SPI-master or just go to nandland.com forward slash SPI-master and you can get at the code there. And if anything changes, uh, that, that's going to have the latest stuff. So GitHub is nice. Um, and there's also a Verilog version of it too, but this one, this video is talking about VHDL. So let's get into it. All right. Here is the SPI master. There's some descriptions at the top. Um, it sends one byte at a time out on the Mosey line. Uh, it also receives byte on the MISO line. And in order to kick off the transaction, you have to send a data valid pulse, and it will serialize uh, ITX byte. <clears throat> There's also this OTX ready line, which is an output of this module, which tells whatever is sending data that it's it's got some availability, and that goes low, meaning not available, when it's busy. And this does support all four SPI modes, which is kind of a pain to have to support those. Um, like I said, that's kind of the, one of the things I don't like about SPI is they couldn't just have picked one mode and stuck with it. They went and did four. So it, it adds some complexity in the SPI master to try to support all that. But uh, I think I got it figured out, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> the other parameter, so that's one of your generics as an input, your SPI mode that you want to operate in. And then the other one is your clocks per half bit. And... This, the purpose of this is to set the frequency of the spy clock. So the spy clock is derived from your I clock, your input clock, and it's a lesser frequency than your input clock has to be. Um, must be greater than or equal to two for that number, so clocks per half bit greater than or equal to two in order to make this work. So for example, if you set it equal to two and you have 100 megahertz input clock, and you, um, this is this generic is equal to two, then your SPI clock is gonna be 25 megahertz, effectively if, divide by four. Okay, so for the entity, this is what it looks like. Um, those are your two generics. You have a reset, a clock input, uh, your mosey, your transmitter side, your byte that you want to send is here. Uh, data valid pulse goes high for one clock cycle every time the, you want to put a new byte on the input. And then OTX ready is an output of this module telling whatever is feeding it that you're ready for the next piece of data. On the receive side, um, you know, you're sending a data out on Mosey, you're receiving something on MISO. Yeah, and uh, when that MISO line gets deserialized, converted from serial to parallel, it'll put the, the received byte out on this ORX byte line and pulse the data valve for one clock cycle. So the upstream module looks for that. And then here's your spy signals. Again, not including chip select for now. We'll add that on later. All right, let's get into how it works. There's some signal definitions here at the top. Uh, this is the beginning of the architecture, signal definitions, and then we begin. So I have this intermediary wire, this W clock polarity. Um, this is setting the clock polarity signal um, based on what SPI mode you're in, and I do the same thing for clock phase, CFA. So those are, again, just to handle all four spy modes, and I won't go to the details of how that exactly works. Um, this kind of a little bit tricky to figure that out, but uh, but it is working now for all modes. So um, this whole process here, basically the whole the sole purpose of this is to know where you are in your uh, you're generating your SPI clock the correct number of times the data data valid pulse comes in. So there's going to be 16 clock edges no matter what mode you're in. So this basically counts down from 16 every single time in order to serialize a single byte. And the reason it's 16 is because there's, you know, a single byte is eight bits, 
but there's two edges per bit, so it's 16 total. So it's counting down from 16 in order to serialize the byte. But it needs to know, like, okay, is it the trailing edge? Is it the leading edge? Um, what, what does it care about? And that's, uh, so it's generating pulses for trailing and leading edges so that further on when you're using the, the SPI modes, it's able to know when to send the next, the next byte out, when to make the clock go high, things like that. Like even here, um, spy clock by you know when, when I reset when you reset it it resets the spy clock to whatever the clock polarity is so if clock polarity idles high or idles low this will take care of that there and so you have a spy clock being generated and <clears throat> when you when you send a this is something I usually do in all of my code so whenever I have like an input being pushed into a module uh, it's like a, like a byte, for example, and a data valid pulse that corresponds with that byte that tells the module that this byte is good now. I always register it, you know, resample it, if you will, inside of the module itself. That's what I'm doing here. So if I if I tx data valid equals one, r tx byte gets i tx byte, and this r tx byte is just an internal signal. And the reason to do this is um, if the let's say you're, you're going to be serializing this byte, so this byte needs to be stable for 16 clock cycles. If the upstream module, for whatever reason, changes the value of that, that ITX byte, then it's going to affect this downstream module. So, you you know, it's just a good practice. It only uses a few extra flip-flops to do it, but um, whenever I have inputs coming into a module, I'm just going to register them and make sure that they're stable so I don't have to rely on the upstream module keeping things stable. It can change values if it wants to, and it won't break this guy. So I think that's good design practice in general. Okay, so for generating the MOSI data, what this process is doing is counting down from TX bit count of seven, and it's sending that most significant bit first. Um, and that's that's basically all it's doing. So it's serializing the data on RTX byte, using RTX bit count as an index into that byte, and putting the data right out on the MOSI line right there. Cool. All right, so now we're gonna be reading in data from the slave. So this is the MISO process here. And again, the handling of the whether or not it's a leading edge and what mode you're in is the complexities associated with some of this stuff. Um, but basically, you know, you have an RX bit count similar to your TX bit count. It starts at seven and you count down to zero. And every time you get a new uh, piece of data on MISO, you sample it and you put it into you, your ORX byte at the appropriate index. And when you're done, you just pulse the data valid pulse with one clock cycle. This is something uh, worth maybe worth talking about where the synthesis tools are smart enough now that you know you can put a default assignment early on in a process. And if it gets overridden later on in the process, uh, like right here, for example, then it'll set the it'll set that just to whoa. Well, a one clock wide pulse for the for the one time that it's overridden. So I usually do this for like data valid pulses where by default you want data valid to be not data valid, except for the one clock cycle where you do want it to be data valid, which is right here. Handy trick. Uh, and then I also have this one uh, process just to align signals correctly uh, on the output side. So that's it for the SPI master. In the next video, we're going to be just running through the test bench for this and simulating it and making sure that it's working correctly. Hey, I'll just wanted to jump in at the end of this video real quick to say, please check out patreon.com forward slash NANDland and consider supporting me there. I would really appreciate it. It helps me cranking out these good tutorials and these videos. So if you found this valuable, uh, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting me. Keep me making good content. Uh, in addition to that, please consider getting yourself a Go board so you can actually program this code and try it out on real hardware. They're available at nanland.com. And thanks for your support.